How many of you are excited to jump into this topic tonight? Anybody anxious about it? Beside me? All right. Who didn't who doesn't know what the topic is or didn't know what the topic is? Is it up there? We all thought I had the greeting time you could slip out, but it's maybe too late for that, so we'll know you're scared, but if you leave now. How many of you uh, honestly uh, ever had the talk with your parents? Everybody talks about the talk. Uh, how, many, how many of your parents had that talk with you? Yeah, really? Any youth here, your parents had the talk with you? All right. We, you know, it's funny how, how uh, obsessed we are in our culture with sex, but a lot of times we're avoiding the serious issues, and, and uh, even more so because a lot of us could never have imagined some of the things that are out there today and what we'd have to talk about. We're going to dive in today, and I've got to be honest, I probably wrestled uh, with this message as much as uh, anything that I've talked about uh, in quite some time. And it's not that I'm hesitant to deal with it or don't have the stuff to deal with it. Part of my, my wrangling with this has just been over what I was not going to be able to say uh, in, in the brief time we have here, um, because there's so much I'm not going to touch on, so much about where the culture is now, how we got there, where we go from here, and those are all critical issues in helping us learn to have the conversations we're going to need to with our families, and need to by friends in such situations, and uh, in the church as well. But we're going to dive in tonight, there's going to be a lot of other uh, contexts uh, that we're going to deal with this, this in, and I can tell you tonight that I may raise more questions than I answer. And you're going to see when I'm done what I mean, that uh, we're just not going to be able to go really in the depth on a lot of things, and that's bothered me, but we're going to do it anyway. We'll be talking about this as the days go on, because this is a huge issue in our culture. It's not only uh, divisive in the culture, but this issue is dividing churches as well. And I can tell you, in the days ahead, uh, a lot of the people who walk away from the faith uh, are going to do so because of confusion surrounding this particular issue. And the Bible talks about in the last days that things are going to get more confusing and troubling, and there's going to be a lot of deception, and no doubt uh, a good part of that is going to be surrounding some of the issues that we talk about tonight. So um, as we go over this in the next couple weeks, um, I want you to, uh, to open your mind to some things. Uh, I know that some, for some people this just seems like a, a, just a simple topic. It's cut and dry, and, and it is. And we need to know where we stand. I was looking at something this week. I believe it was um, uh, time, uh, uh, New York Times Online. And it was talking about an uh, organization called the Clarity Project. And they survey all kinds of churches, websites, their policies, everything. They look online to see where churches stand. And then they rate you uh, kind of on a six-pronged scale of how open you are to these things. This is a, an organization on the other side of this issue. And they're trying to really nail us down. And they said at the top... The 100 largest churches in the country, uh, they could not determine uh, anything definitive about where they stood on this issue. That in itself tells you something. People just aren't addressing it. And a lot of people, there's a church this uh, past week, Assemblies of God Church, where they came out and fully embraced everything. They're not in the assemblies uh, anymore. But uh, he started out by talking about how he had gone to all kinds of friends and pastors and leaders and they all said, don't even go there. Don't even try to touch that subject. Well, uh, after tonight's message, I, I don't think there's going to be any doubt where we stand on the issue. Uh, originally, this was going to be just a one-night message. We're going we're to make it two. So I'm going to lay some foundations tonight. And the title of this, How We Respond, is really going to be more of what I talk about next week. Because this week's going to be a lot of information. And I kind of look at it like we're skimming a stone uh, across a big lake. And it's going to take those first big couple hops over a, over a pretty broad territory. That's what, that's what it's going to be like tonight. We're going to skim just a couple uh, main uh, issues from a lot of different directions. And then next week that stone's going to hit a few more uh, quick times before it kind of plummets down deep into, into one main issue of the way that we need to respond to people in this. Because the bottom line is if people are going to see the truth of Christ, they first need to see the compassion of Christ in us. Because Jesus is not out to reject people, he's out to reconcile people to himself, and he uses us to do that. The Bible says that it's God's kindness that leads to repentance, and that's where uh, we're going to end up next week. So I just want to encourage you to be here and be a part uh, of that discussion. The first issue we're going to dive right into tonight 
Uh, in fact, we're going to do it in three things, and tonight's going to be the first. I'm going to talk about truth. And I'm going to talk about truth from a couple angles, one from the angle of the world, and we're going to see how their truth kind of relates to the truth of God. And we're going to see a contrast between something that's stable, something that's constant, something that doesn't change, and something that's very volatile, something that's shifting, something that's always transitioning. And uh, that's truth. Next week, we're going to look at the concept of humility, and we're going to look at it from the standpoint of where we need to be as a church toward this issue, if we're going to have any effect at all in the culture. And I'm also going to challenge people who may be wrestling with issue or still searching for truth and how they need to approach God in this whole matter as well. And then finally, we're going to talk about uh, the aspect of compassion, and that's where we're primarily going to focus on next week. Don't be here this week just to get the information and miss next week to really look at how we need to respond both to God uh, and to others. But let's dive into truth. Uh, truth has to be the foundation for any stand that we take as followers of Christ. And, uh, you know, but where does that truth come from? Who determines what it is? I can't speak for the rest of the world, but I can tell you, and hopefully you're with me, and where that truth comes from, because it's the only perspective that really matters in the end. Jesus says in John chapter 17, verse 7, he's praying for his followers, and he asks his Father to sanctify them, to set them apart, to make them holy, to help them grow into what he wants them to be. And he says to do that by the truth, because your word is true. So let's go to that source of truth. And let's look at a few places where this issue uh, is addressed, particularly the issue of same-sex attraction. We're going to talk about issues today, uh, the transgender issues and all kinds of identities in that regard. We'll get into some of that as well. But a lot of these scriptures are going to be dealing with same-sex relations that we, uh, we land on today. So I want to dive into those. And you've got, have you got several of those up there? Right there, because I want you to turn to these as we come to them, because I want to take just a little bit of time to look at each one. We're not going to read all but a couple of them, but I want you to look at them while I'm talking about them, see what's there, and I want to skim over just a couple of the objections that people have in each of these cases, and maybe what some of the critics uh, are missing in all that. So, uh, in Genesis 19, 1 through 11, that's a passage where the two angels come to uh, Abraham's nephew Lot, to Sodom, to warn him that God is going to destroy the city. Uh, and the men of the city surrounded Lot's house. They were trying to abduct and, and rape those messengers. And uh, here's the thing about that. In just a second, you're going to see some of the arguments. But that narrative comes right before God destroys it. So God is clearly portraying what's going on in this situation as at least part of the evidence of why he's destroying uh, the city because they've reached that height of wickedness. And to this day, the term sodomy is used to uh, describe uh, the act that these men were trying to perpetrate uh, on those outsiders. Now, one of the things that critics try to do is they try in this passage to separate uh, that same sex behavior from why Sodom was destroyed. And one of the claims that they make is that in this culture, uh, it was their practice that, that they were uh, aggressive in that way toward outsiders, and it had little to do with sex. Uh, they weren't necessarily homosexual men, they'll say, uh, but this was how they showed dominance over people who came in from the outside. So the real sin they see is arrogance and oppression and social injustice, and the type of uh, sexual contact was in, inconsequential. But the book of Jude, uh, which touches on this just real briefly, talks about Sodom, and it specifically says uh, that the sin of Sodom was sexual immorality and sins against their own bodies. It says that was the root of their problem. And I'm not saying same-sex attracted people today are like the men of Sodom, uh, but it's a stretch to say that a specific act that these men were trying to perpetrate uh, had no play in the progression of things that eventually destroyed that city. Now, the next part uh, I want to look at is Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13. These are passages of Old Testament law that forbid all kinds of uh, sex outside of marriage, from adultery uh, to incestuous relationships, bestiality, all kinds of stuff. And people don't like this passage because it refers to same-sex acts uh, as detestable or an abomination. And, uh, you know, that doesn't seem to a lot of people that you or I might know who are struggling with these issues or, or who are uh, living in seemingly loving relationships. But the bottom line is I can't deny how God puts it in, in those terms. And the Bible is never concerned with political correctness. But critics mostly to write this passage off because they say, well, this is just simply Old Testament law. In this case, it's portraying a, a, a male-dominated culture uh, in which sex was basically just a way of subjugating women. 
Now that sounds extreme, but that's the way that a lot of extreme feminists view it today. And they argue that these same-sex relations were not accepted in that male-dominated uh, hierarchy because males weren't supposed to put themselves in a place that relegated them to being like females. And that was really the only issue. It wasn't necessarily, again, the type of sex. It was the type of domination. They make this a domination issue in both of those instances. Uh, but uh, here's the thing. We can impose some extreme political type of view uh, on a, a text on another culture. But that's what they're trying to do and they're relegating into that. Now, first of all, looking at uh, sexual relations as some kind of a power play uh, is a dismal view of sex. That's definitely not what God intended for his people. It's definitely not uh, what he's trying to concede here in his law that somehow sex was only to subordinate women so men shouldn't be putting themselves in that position. God's laws were meant to guard those type of relationships, to preserve the beauty of, uh, and the benefits of sexual intimacy. And again, we can impose uh, some t political views, especially extreme views on that culture. But the main objection to these texts of the law uh, is simply this. They say, well, the same law uh, forbids eating foods like uh, shellfish or pork or mixing certain types of fabrics together or having contact with a, a woman during her time of the month and all these type of things that we don't live by and we don't observe in the same way that they did uh, today. It also requires all kinds of washing and cleansing routines and a lot of stuff that, that doesn't necessarily uh, uh, something that we have to apply ourselves today. But for one thing, you've got to look at the context of that. And if you get there, go to these passages and look at them. You're going to see that the context of that, uh, it's not the immediate context of those laws about food and fabrics and cleansing. It's in the middle of a list of, of uh, sexually immoral things. And so to put that, the law is kind of categorized in the various things. And they all applied to Israel at that time. But there's different things God to try to, is trying to point out by those laws. Um, uh, those sexual sins that it's listed among, if you look at those, are things that people today, most people, uh, would definitely look at and say, those things are reprehensible. Take out adultery and same-sex relations and everything else listed there, most uh, civilized people would say, that stuff we oughtn't even go near. That's the type of things it's listed among. And again, I'm not trying to disparage people who are caught up in those things, but God says all of these things are out of bounds uh, in my terms because they're not going to take you uh, to a good place. But the main objection there is because uh, they link all these laws kind of on that same level. Uh, and here's the thing. Uh, the laws on sexual relations and a lot of other uh, uh, moral behaviors are kind of in a different classification than those things about food and fabrics and cleaning because God uses a lot of his laws to illustrate points beyond just the surface of, of, of doing this and not doing that. And the problem of lumping these things all together is that even uh, scholars can miss the underlying principles of these laws. Because God just didn't set out to make a bunch of rules and regulations to see if somehow we could follow them. Even the obscure things in those laws uh, had a specific purpose or meaning that a lot of times people miss because they don't look at the whys behind what God is saying or doing. Uh, for example, some of God's laws are meant to reveal something about uh, his character. Some uh, show something about what he wants uh, to see character in us. Others are illustrative of the fact that he wants separation between his people and some of those nations uh, that were surrounding him. But here's how principles work. If you look at those, for example, some of the food and fabric laws or even some of the worship routine laws were illustrations uh, of God's attributes and the distinctions he sets aside for himself and the distinctions he wants his people to have. Others were symbolic and prophetic of something that was to come or something that Christ would later uh, fulfill. The laws about uh, cleansing not only reflected God's purity, but they were setting safeguards for health that kept, kept things like uh, fungal infections or bacteria or bloodborne infections from uh, running rampant in that uh, nomadic culture because it would have wiped out uh, entire segments of society. So the principle behind some of those obscure laws even are the fact that God is showing his love and care and protection of his people. So you've got to look at a law and not just look at the surface of it, but say, why is God saying this time? What is he trying to show us through that particular thing? And when studying the Bible, we need to look for those type of principles, the whys behind the whats, those timeless truths that can be extrapolated and applied to issues that may not even be issues at the time or may not even be mentioned in the text. 
And when you understand principles, even some of the most difficult passages become a little clear. For example, uh, some people will look at uh, very difficult passages in the Old Testament, like when, when uh, God uh, talked about uh, wiping out another nation, don't leave anybody alive, and people will look at that and say, well, the Old Testament promotes genocide, and so they just write it all off. But you look at how the nations surrounding uh, God's people led them off, off base time and time and time again, and God had a bigger plan that he wasn't going to let any of that get in the way of. And God understood with some of these nations that they had reached a point literally of no return. And God only knew that, that they were never going to change. They were never going to turn back. And everybody born into that society from then on was already headed to hell. And the most compassionate thing he could have done was just to put it into that entire, entire cycle, preserve a purpose for his people, uh, and in that cycle of death that was to happen for anybody else that would have been born into that culture. It's not easy to see, but you begin to at least understand a little bit more that something isn't just as terrible as it might seem on that context because you're looking at the principle. You're looking at what it says about God's character and his purposes. And that's what we need to get to when we're looking at things in scripture. But the principles regarding moral behaviors like, like sexual activity, uh, they're pretty straightforward. It simply says, don't do these things because it's going to affect individuals and families and societies in an adverse way. And people might argue that same-sex relationships between committed individuals are not harming anyone, but it's no coincidence that all the passages, Old and New Testament, referring to that particular behavior, manifested itself in some extreme way that eventually took the culture to a very unexpected place. But... The issue isn't just Old Testament issue. Uh, let's look at a couple things in the New Testament because it has uh, actually uh, quite a few things to say about it as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse, uh, or 6, verses 9 and 10, and 1 Timothy 1, 10 are kind of similar passages as well. And these passages list a, a, a bunch of things that have no place in God's kingdom. And I always want you to notice the other things because some of these things are pretty ordinary things that all of us struggle with. Not just singling out one thing, but among those things... It lists same-sex relations, particularly, uh, again, uh, men having sex with other men. And the objection to this passage is that in this particular culture, they argue that some of the terms meant were really referring to temple prostitution in, in which uh, men would have dominant relationships uh, with younger men, sometimes in cases underage uh, children. And so once again, you see that theme of domination that people try to make this, is they make it an issue of domination and not the sexual act. Uh, well, here's the thing. Uh, when Paul referenced these behaviors and he was writing these things, he was well aware of the current culture. And Paul was also well aware of the Old Testament culture. He was an expert in the law. So the implications of all this didn't elude him. He wasn't just condemning uh, pagan worship practices at the time. He was deliberately repeating some of the moral uh, restrictions of the Old Testament that still applied in the New Testament. And most critics can't really explain that away because it really is pretty obvious what it's saying. So what they do resort to is simply critique, uh, critiquing Paul's values. And a lot of them will say, well, if you look at Paul, uh, you know, Paul, uh, you know, he was disparaging toward women. Paul condoned slavery, uh, neither of which is true. Uh, in the Corinthians, Paul addressed the disruptions in worship that happened to involve women because there were some logistical things in the way worship took place, and there was information and education that women didn't have access to, so they were talking back and forth their husbands, and there was just commotion, and he said, this kind of thing shouldn't be going on in worship. But he wasn't disparaging women because Paul had several women who spearheaded the ministries he was involved in uh, in various local places. And he wasn't uh, condoning slavery simply by telling Christians how to influence those they serve and to make the most of their situations. Now, uh, before we look at uh, some of the contemporary side of, of things and what's going on with the various issues, I want to look at one more passage of scripture and turn to this one because I want to read it together. In Romans chapter 1. Uh, I'm not going to get into the arguments about this one, but uh, once again, critics cite kind of the spiritual issues of the time, and they even argue about the meeting between what natural and unnatural affections mean, and they, they get uh, real nuanced with everything. Uh, and the, a lot of these, one of the things I want you to be certain of, and we're skipping these things so fast, which really bothers me, but I just want you to know, we're going to come back to all this in different contexts, that there's stuff there that refutes some of the very convincing uh, things that these guys will tell you. Because they'll really get elaborate and they'll get, and a lot of times, you know, they'll go to backgrounds, they'll go to other things. It seems like they're getting really deep, but they're not going to the full depth of those principles to see really what's going on and what God's getting at. 
In this particular passage, I'm not going to get into those things, but um, uh, what I want you to see in this one um, is even uh, ungodly people who know the Bible, and I've listened to a lot of them, and uh, they will even concede, especially when you get to a passage like this, that it pretty much means what it says, and the Bible's pretty clear about that, so they simply just choose not to, not to accept the Bible. I respect that view more than uh, scholars, theologians, uh, pastors who try to either skirt around the issue or do theological gymnastics to try to get around to tell us that it really is not saying what it seems to be saying. And this is one of those passages. This one's also kind of difficult to dispel because it not only addresses men, so it takes out that issue of dominance that they keep saying is really the main issue because it also addresses very specifically what's going on with some of the women. So let's read that in Romans chapter 1. Beginning in verse 18, and the title of that section says God's wrath against sinful humanity. And again, that may sound harsh towards some of the people you and I who know who just want to live in loving relationships, uh, but that's what's there, and at the principle behind it all is God is trying to save us from ourselves in many ways. But verse number 18 says the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people who suppress the truth, talking about truth, by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, uh, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him or gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Does it just sound like our culture today? And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. That's where the idol worship coming in because that stuff was going on at the time. Therefore, God gave them over, because they're following these things, to the sinful desires of their hearts. Now, we're going to talk about, you know, you know Joel, this, this, they, you know, this is not something people are born with. There are natural inclinations of the human heart that when God takes his hand off things, that's the direction people will go. It's down there somewhere. And he says that when that happened... Uh, he gave them over to the degrading of their bodies with another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, again, the things we're talking about, and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who was ever, forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations, sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. They committed shameful acts with other men and received themselves a due penalty for their error. Now, th some of the critics just get really, they'll talk about, well, it, when it says unnatural relations, that means that if for you the natural relations were with the same sex, then abandoning your natural thing is unnatural, and it just kind of flips them all, it gets kind of weird. That's why most, most scholars will even say, th this is what it means, and, and they just choose to write off the scripture, not look at it the same way as we do. Furthermore, just as they did not think it was worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they uh, do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. And again, this doesn't sound like you're describing the average person. I'm not saying it is, but I'm saying this is what happens in a human heart when they choose to go their own, when they choose to go their own way. And it will happen with any of us if we do that. They begin filled with every kind of these things. They are gossips, some pretty plain things, slanders. God haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. People try to make this about love, but you really lose those things when it happens, especially in the terms that God wants to, to show it toward us. And though they know God's righteous decree, and those that do such things deserve the death, they continue to do these very things, but also approve of them, those who practice them. Years ago, David Wilkerson, before he's passed on, had a, a very prophetic ministry in many ways. And he made the comment, he, he said that, that this is going to come to such a head one day, not because of all the people who identify with certainly, because that's still a, a small percentage, but because all the people who condone what's going on in society and come alongside those things. And that's what's happening. In a nutshell, God is basically saying that he's made it clear uh, who he is and he makes himself known, but humanity refuses to recognize that. And when they do that, they turn their attention to all kinds of earthly objects and pleasures. It describes that in several ways there. Even their worship gets directed at physical things, including other people and other ideas, instead of focusing those things on God. Now, one more thing before we, uh, we hop into some of the cultural stuff. 
Uh, this is one of the biggest arguments people will simply make about this, and it sounds pretty reasonable on, on one level, and that's that Jesus never talked about this. Jesus didn't utter a word, and in a, in a way that's true. If we look at, we're talking about red letters, if all we look at and say all that Jesus meant to say was the red, uh, was the red letters, but the Gospels don't record a lot of what Jesus said. In fact, they tell us, uh, uh, John tells us that if everything Jesus did was written down, the world wouldn't be able to contain the volume. So that's a lot of stuff uh, that he did. And remember, Jesus' primary ministry was in the Jewish culture, so they already knew that God's law was clear on this issue. So there was a lot of ways that Jesus didn't need to hit on things that they fully understood. Uh, but one of the things this shows is that people really lack an understanding of who Jesus is and what he came to do. I see this as the issue of salvation and how many Bible scholars can get into deep things and yet miss the basics of sin and our separation from God and what needs to take place. And people not understanding the fact that, uh, uh, that Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, and everything in that was pointing to him. In fact, if you look at the scriptures that Jesus has and everything he now, the things he's quoting from, uh, the things that he confirms, that's Old Testament. That was the scripture to him. And even before a word of his was recorded, uh, he confirmed that God's word would endure forever. But Jesus is the living word. He is the embodiment of everything God meant to tell us. That means that everything in the book is what Jesus is trying to tell us. Not just the words he uttered with his voice. And those things were clear to those that he ministered most of the time around. There were a lot of issues they contradicted Jesus on, but this was one of those issues among which they would have not taken issue with. So uh, we see that in the New Testament, which is all what Jesus, 2 Timothy 3.16 talks about all scripture being God-breathed, being inspired from him, and it's profitable for correction and instruction about what's right and what's wrong. The bottom line in all of these things, in all these passages, to argue that they don't really say what they seem to say or that they don't apply to things today, you have to do one of four things. And in everything that I said really quickly about some of these, one of these things was going on. Either they were adding something to the scripture, they were reading something into it, they were taking something out of scripture that wasn't there, they were discounting or diminishing certain parts of scriptures that they just didn't mean as much as other parts, or they were essentially implying that you need some deep theological reasoning in either to comprehend what, what really seems obvious on the surface. One of those four things was going on. And that's just to say that you can't say, well, that's Old Testament, so it doesn't apply. Or that's, uh, you know, Paul's opinion, so it doesn't apply. Or that doesn't seem to jive with the, the parts that I really like. So, or, or uh, you know, that part of the Bible is not on the same level as other parts. All these arguments... What they really reveal is that most of these critics simply don't regard the whole of Scripture as the inspired, infallible Word of God. And maybe that's why they can disregard the Bible's strict warning not to add to or take away anything from the Word. It's particularly talking about the law when it says that because all of it has a purpose, Old Testament and New Testament. Some will say the Old Testament isn't your testament. Well, God redeemed us under the New Testament. All that stuff in the Old Testament paints pictures of things. It helps us understand more clearly. And I'm not saying we live by every letter of the law, but there are prophecies and patterns and principles that apply across time and space that are rooted in God's character, and God's character uh, doesn't change. And people can raise doubts about specific and isolated passages here, but when an issue uh, is described repeatedly in similar terms, both Old and New Testament, and it always comes up in the context of, of, of cultural and spiritual decline, that says something about that, where that way of life will eventually take a society. And while the extremes described in the Bible may not apply to your neighbor or co-worker who lives a different lifestyle, the Bible is clear about not even starting down that path because where it ultimately leads. And so the issue goes way beyond whether an individual decides about who they are or what a couple decides about uh, their relationship. History shows that when societies uh, uh, disregard those behaviors and those lifestyles become the norm, uh, that d b bad things happen. And when people disregard God's guidelines, Pastor Jeff talked about God's guardrails in, in one of his messages. It says when they bust through those things that they basically cast off all restraint. And it can start with something that might seem very innocent, even loving. But when you jump across the boundaries that God is, has uh, set for us, uh, that's only going to lead to pain and separation from him. And societies that attempt particularly to redefine things about human personhood uh, uh, will eventually collapse. That's where we're headed with other issues, abortion and the like. Now, here may be the most practical confirmation that we, a lot of times I ask God about issues like, say, God, these are tough issues. 
we got to deal with these and you're going to be hearing stuff and I can't be there all the time to go with you and look at all these deep insights and they get really tough to deal with and I say God at some point you just need to reveal yourself in a way that tells us that we're on the right track you need to start doing something in our midst that says these are the people who are sticking to my word these are the people who have got it right and I look at things, and I don't think it's any coincidence that those who fully accepted the Bible's authority have also been the most effective at spreading the gospel around the world. And seeing God operate in, in, in uh, the miraculous ways that even Jesus said would accompany the authentic preaching of his word. Those who hold the, the word in that high esteem experience God's power in a way that those who discount the word are never going to find. And there's a reason why even some in the LGBTQ community are attracted to spirit-led churches. Uh, I'm sure some are trying to come in and change things from within. But there is a power and a vibrancy that's undeniably real uh, in places like this. And those who are sincerely searching for the truth are drawn to it. And anybody is welcome to come into this place. But if we start compromising the truth to fit people's lifestyles rather than to align with God's word, if we start swapping his truth with their truth or our truth, then eventually we're going to lose that power. And churches that try to embrace everything are going to lose hold of the things that really matter. They're going to become like the, those described in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, who in the last days will have a form of godliness but deny the power of God. You see, we're going to forfeit God's power if we end up forfeiting the truth. And that's what I want you to see in this first point about truth, is that whether it's in regard to God's word or in regard to people's own identity, most people see the truth as something that's up for debate. They see it as something fluid. They see it as something fluctuating that's open to interpretation. And people on the other side won't even take issue with me labeling them in that way because they do view truth as a malleable thing, as a fluid and evolving thing, because to them, that's open-minded. That's forward thinking. Uh, I recall some research I was doing years ago on, on millennials and kind of their postmodern thought process, which basically means that they're just rethinking old concepts and values, including the, the concept of truth. And a lot of them had adopted a view that in any given situation, what a person perceives to have happened is just as real as what actually happened. If somebody comes in here and there's a, there's a, a melee happens and somebody does this to somebody, but somebody else perceived it as the other person started it and somebody said something that really was, then that reality is their reality. That's their truth. And that seemed kind of like a strange concept. It's like, yeah, that, that'll really make it, that'll really get traction somewhere. But you fast forward about 20 years, and not only is that applying now to situations, it's applying to people literally who they are. And they said, who I think I am is just as real and valid as maybe who I really am. And that's the thinking that they've adopted. And uh, you see that across the whole LGBTQ spectrum, that whatever a person chooses to define themselves as, that's who they are. But here's the thing about truth. Uh, once you get to the point where basically uh, anything can be true, uh, then nothing becomes true. And that's the difference between the world's truth and God's truth. The world's truth is ever-changing, and, and they like it that way. God's truth is never-changing. And in order to be truth, that has to be the way it is. Now, I want to very, very briefly consider some of the array of the sexual orientations and identities that are going on uh, on this topic that are represented by the LGBTQ uh, and, and look at a little bit at the evolution there. And, and what we're going to see is that the same shifting views that people have about Scripture, they also apply to their own life in the way things change. So the first thing, just simply look at this. It kind of started out just basic. Now, all this has been in the workings for decades. Uh, all of it's been in, in operation throughout history. But in our culture, really this kind of started out as a debate between being gay or lesbian. And... Uh, mostly for the part one or the other is where the focus was. A lot of the stuff we're dealing with now was back there some way, but it really wasn't on most people's radar. Uh, the views toward that were pretty disparaging. I remember when I was a kid, some of the terms you'd use to refer to and people thought nothing of it. Uh, there were sectors in society where it was common and people, uh, in, in a lot of times in the fashion industry, entertainment, and things were going on, but even people there weren't coming out because it still wasn't uh, socially acceptable. Uh, but um, it started to come out uh, in, in things like comedy. And if you look back at some of the manifestos that some of the real activists have to say how we're going to start to get this into the culture, it's things like entertainment and comedy. Because you get people loosening up and laughing about something, it begins to come in. So they deliberately use some of those avenues. 
And pretty soon it began to get a little more acceptable. You started to see in schools some alliances being built with the uh, gay, lesbian, straight alliances and people coming together on those things. So far as the percentage of people from studies way, way back even before my time, they kind of extrapolated a 1 in 10 uh, sort of a thing, which really wasn't an exact thing, but they slapped that on a lot of their literature and so forth. So that was all kind of where things were at that point. People uh, looked at it in some ways as a choice. Others were saying, no, you can't choose it, but that debate was still going on. Um, and so that was kind of where things were at for just a period of time. Now, I want to uh, jump to one thing that maybe at the very beginning we could have, is uh, what people think causes that same-sex attraction. And uh, homosexual, bisexual, when you start to get into gender issues, are a little different thing. One of them deals more with psychological things. The other deals with something people are trying to prove has a, a biological element to it or a DNA. They're kind of different issues, but along the same lines, the research kind of still applies. Speaking from a worldly span standpoint, nobody really knows for sure what's taking place here. It's probably a combination of innate desires and sociological, psychological factors and other things. But there's a lot of misinformation about uh, things that have really been taken as fact. Science has attempted over and over to validate some sort of genetic uh, disposition or DNA factor. But contrary to the popular assumptions, uh, there's been no clear physiological or DNA indicator found in any of these things. In fact, the guy who instigated uh, many years ago the brain studies that people were going to and using as proof to say, ah, this is new. Your brain at one point you know, either goes this direction or that direction, and they never really proved it went anything to do with your sex. They just said that men went one way and women went another way, and it's like, well, everybody of us already knew that, but that was supposedly to show something. And the guy who did that research, who was spearheaded it, said that the most pre uh, the most uh, uh, inaccurate interpretation of his research was that people are born that way. And this was a guy who was an advocate uh, for those lifestyles. He didn't have any problem with it, but he said that wasn't what his research was, was proving. And he said it may never prove that. So there's a lot of misunderstanding in all that because in spite of that, many activists insist that there's still a biological connection. They're still looking, but many educators promote that hypothesis as fact in, in the classrooms. Now, that's not to say that some people don't have some sort of uh, physiological or psychological disposition toward certain things or certain desires, because the bottom line is this. If a person has certain desires or inclinations or they're attracted uh, to the same sex for whatever reason, nature, nurture, biology, background, whatever factors are going on, if the fact is they feel that way, I can't argue with their thoughts or feelings, because for them, it's just, for some of them, it, it is as if there's been no choice. That's just, that's just all they've known. And there are people in that category. We're going to talk about that next week. Um, so I can't argue with necessarily how they think or feel. Uh, but in a culture where things are becoming increasingly acceptable, even celebrated, uh, there's individuals who are just simply going to explore their sexuality in ways that deviate from God's norm, whether that's the way they really feel or not. But it's reasonable to conclude that there's a combination of social and environmental and uh, psychological, spiritual factors. Austin and I were talking about before that, talking about the, just making sure we understand this is a spiritual issue. The enemy has hold on people, and he may be using something that's in them, tendencies they have, but he's laying hold of them in a way that they're choosing a way that is not what God intended for any of us. But uh, you can look at other things. People, this may not be an accurate, you know, a fair assessment, but people may be uh, predisposed to alcoholism or grow up in an alcoholic home and be in that environment, but it doesn't excuse drinking or addictive behavior. And so none of those things, whether we feel we're born into it or whether it's other factors, uh, excuse things that go against God's ways. Because as a result of our condition, uh, as fallen humans, everyone is born with faulty traits. And we all experience sinful desires and temptations. How we handle those things is our choice. Now, most people don't look at it as a choice, so they're going to say, well, uh, it's beyond my control, and if God's a God of love, then why is he going to condemn people that he, cr that he created that way? Um, that objection may be sincere, but just like people misunderstand Jesus, it's a really huge misunderstanding about what really happened when those first humans chose to go their own way and defy God. Because when sin entered the world, it changed everything about us to the very core. It changed our nature. And all of a sudden, we weren't at all the way God intended us. And we can no longer assume that the way we think or feel or what seems right to us is the way God intended it. But I want you to be assured of this. Someday, if they do happen to somehow prove that something is the way it is biologically or some other factor, one, be very weary of how people cast what's going on in truth and research because that's already in there. But two, 
It doesn't matter whatever they prove because the fact is I already know we're born that way. They can prove that this has happened down to the very root of our being. But we are born sinful. We are messed up. There is something askew in all of us. uh, And when we go our own, what simply definition of sin is going our own way. That's what's happened and that's not the way God intended. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is what? It's death. And that's what happens. But because Jesus gave his life to pay the penalty for that sin, we don't have to live in that. And he extends grace to us. But grace doesn't excuse the need to change. Grace enables us to change. Grace is not just a forgiveness and mercy word. Grace is a power word. It's enablement. And when God gives us grace, he allows things to happen in our lives that we can never bring about by ourselves. So, uh, B, you get to the second thing. Now, here's the thing. Acceptance began to grow. People started coming out. It became more common to identify Uh, as one or the other, more people begin to say, well, you know what, I'm not really sure, but I think I'm okay with either, so they begin to identify as bisexual. And the explanation that people were giving for why they felt that way began to clash just a little bit with the notion that there was not a choice factor involved in this. Because in an article citing interviews with a bunch of celebrities who were talking about the fact that they felt this is probably how they could define themselves, they were giving some reasons that really didn't sound like they didn't have a, a choice in it. But they were saying things like, um, uh, like they just wanted to be more open-minded or they wanted to take control of their own sexuality or they just wanted to keep their options open. That's some, I don't mean to make light of that, but that's some of the reasons that they gave. So now all of a sudden the distinctions weren't so cut and dry. And at that point, you begin to start seeing that the emphasis on sexuality was getting a little more fluid and that the tent was expanding. So some had claimed that as high as 20% or more of the population could identify on some level with either being L, G, or B. But then the narrative began to change from focusing on mainly your sexual orientation to include the whole realm of gender identity. And that's where the T came in. First, it was focusing mainly on transgender, crossing from one Uh, to the other. But it's gone way beyond that as we know. And uh, this isn't a recent development. In fact, for about three decades now, I remember way back then, I was looking at some stuff uh, from some organizations that were getting some inroads into schools and assemblies and other organizations and health-related things like Planned Parenthood. And some of the leaders of these organizations weren't really making their views known because they never would have flew in that day. But if you read some of the things they thought, they had some pretty far-out views on gender. And one of the things that they were writing about is that they didn't believe gender was really a thing that was, that was very real. They thought it was basically a social construct that uh, came about by how we are raised and traditional norms and all that. And it was really something distinct from the anatomy that you were born with. And that view wouldn't have gained a lot of traction uh, 20, 30 years ago. But you fast forward 20 years and what was once a fringe concept has become uh, a prominent cultural narrative and a very widely accepted view. And all of a sudden, gender uh, dysphoria, which is a technical term for that, went from being regarded as, as a, at least a mild psychological dysfunction to a, just a legitimate anomaly that can be accommodated if, if nothing else, uh, if a person uh, so chooses by gender reassignment. And for many of the foremost experts in this field who are advocates of that uh, cause, uh, they will admit that this doesn't technically make a man a woman or a, uh, or a woman a man. That's why intense hormone theory has, therapy has to be part of it. If somebody fully transitioned and exhumed their body in 100 years, they would still be male or female the way they were born. Now, I'm not making light to say that a person, again, isn't inclined that way or feel that way or really for some odd reason have those things going on. But the, what, what we think sometimes, say, well, it's just helping a person on the, get to the outside the way they feel on the inside. Uh, Some of those things aren't, again, as accurate as people are trying to make them. Um, In the early 2000s, there was a couple of cover stories that uh, came out in two of the the most influential publications in the world. And the general headline said this, is gender for real? And that's when the voices kind of started to emerge from the shadows uh, to where this whole thing began to uh, start causing people to rethink uh, culture and rethink literally who they were. And that's when this stuff really began to take hold. And at one time, the criteria was pretty high to qualify for making a transition in your life. Um, but what's happened to this point is now even children are being allowed to uh, entertain the pro- start through the process. And I looked, uh, listened to a, a panel of some experts before Congress, and again, many of these were advocates and had, were okay with these transitions happening down the road. But even many of them were admitting that borderline on abuse to, uh, to allow children to go down that road of thinking they had to decide who and what they were because their brains are still in, in development into their early teens. Uh, 
Some of them can't even decide what would be right to eat for themselves or what to dress, and yet we're letting them make decisions. You remember the case just a bit ago where there was a, a, a father and a mother uh, kind of disputing over whether they went a, one was going to let the child start to transition when they were in elementary school. And that's what's happening in our culture. We're getting to the point where those type of voices that would contradict that, even the experts on their side are going to be silenced because it really doesn't uh, fit in the agenda. So you add 2 to 5% to the equation to account for those that identify uh, as uh, transgender, and all of a sudden you've got almost a quarter of the population that could identify in some way with L, G, B, or T. But transitioning from one to the other is just the tip of the iceberg because many refuse to be confined uh, by that narrow identity, and that's where the Q comes in. Uh, originally that stand for gender queer, which isn't t typically the type of language we can use. It's one that somebody else can use. You can't use it a bonnet, but it basically uh, meant to include anybody who didn't identify with any of the traditional gender norms or the simple binary designations of male, male or female. And it can be any mix of sexual orientations and gender identities. And there have been people who have identified as many as 70 different uh, gender variations that they say uh, are possible and that people can identify with. And it encompasses so much that people just begin to take on the designation of Q as meaning questioning so that it can include anyone who's just confused or uncertain uh, about where they stand in all of this. And if that isn't fully inclusive, they now add a plus onto the end of it. And by now, what you end up with is an array of uh, really minorities finding, uh, forming kind of an identity coalition that encompasses what many would say is as much as a third of the population. And listen, I've... A lot of people don't want to be viewed as fitting into uh, a mold. That's not popular. Uh, and who doesn't want the chance to redefine themselves? So it's not even unreasonable to not be politically correct to say this, but there are people I know who are exploring some of these things just because they want to assert their independence and their individuality. And then you add to this the fact that this entire movement has become really, for many, the civil rights uh, issue of our time in that sense, so wanting to be categorized in the same way as, as, uh, as a particular race or other minority groups that are considered to be marginalized in society. And in that sense, you get to the point where over half the population can identify with something here on some level. And that's uh, the point that we've reached. And that's why the news cycle is dominated by issues like this to the point where everybody needs to come to turn. My daughter at a secular university, uh, in a lot of the leadership roles she filled, when they would have training times, two-thirds of the time would be on, on this particular issue, just this one aspect of it, because it really is beginning to dominate the discussion. Here's where this, this has all led us. If you look back at the history, it's really where people have been driving it the whole time. Because now, all of a sudden, it just didn't fall neatly into distinct categories of sexual orientation. But you've got an entire spectrum of identities. Uh, thus, the rainbow. That didn't just come about because it started to emerge at the time you know, around the civil rights movement or even more recently, the emphasis on, on uh, cultural diversity. Uh, that symbolism was there a long time ago because the idea was always for people just to see themselves somewhere on a broad spectrum. You may identify right here as completely this, somebody else completely this, but somewhere in between. And once they can get people to just to view we're all on the same thing, who can take issue with anything? I saw a study of uh, some students in uh, Massachusetts schools that were being asked in an educational survey whether they considered themselves 100% heterosexual, 100% homosexual, or something in between. And then they turned it with, with that kind of begging the question and said the same thing about gender. Do you, do you see yourself identifying fully as feminine or masculine or something in between? Well, in this generation diversity, how many people are going to be intended to think they're 100% anything? So they start getting people to consider we're all just somewhere in this fluid spectrum. And the thing about a spectrum is there are no lines. One thing just fuses to another. And I can look back even in some of the churches accepting some of these things. And I say at some point, isn't there a line somewhere in all this? One of the most popular things uh, in, in universities uh, are drag shows where people just simply make sport of, of uh, uh, crossing gender lines. And I'm saying, you know, that I'd maybe rather see that than them acting out some other ways. But you know what? I'm thinking, that's just making sport of something. God's, don't we look at some of this in the church and say, even if you can somehow make the case that people are loving your relationship, don't you look at some of that just making sport and light and, and all these things and say, it somewhere haven't we crossed the line? But when we're on a spectrum, you don't see any line because the lines have been blurred, if not erased altogether somewhere in the background. And I'm going to tell you this, young people today have quite a different view than those who uh, have insisted all along that this isn't a matter of any choice. They're still not going to acknowledge that. 
Because they'll say whatever fluctuation they're born, that they have, that that's just the way they are. But in a national news documentary not long ago, there were a bunch of teens being interviewed who saw themselves somewhere on this spectrum. And one after another was saying basically, yeah, I may be this today, but in 10 years I may, I may feel something else. So they believe that there's fluctuation and change in that whole thing. What I look at and say is in 10 years, many of them are going to find that none of this has worked and they're still going to be looking for answers. We live in a time when people want to make their own rules, not just about what they do, but about who they are and what they are. I was reading in Time, it was Time or Newsweek just a while back an article on the wide array of gender identities that many of these youth, young adults adapt. And one person after another was saying, no one else has a right to define me or who I am. Even their own physiology was not going to define them. They were taking matters into their own hands and deciding who and what they wanted to be. Now that sounds empowering. That sounds, uh, you know, like uh, something that maybe a person would want to take into their own hands. But life isn't about empowering ourselves. Life is about relying on God and, ch and letting Him change and empower us. And that's the transformation people need. And that's what we're going to look at next week. What I want you to take from this week is simply this. If you hold to the truth of God's word, understand, first of all, the difference between the world's truth and God's truth. The world's truth about God and about themselves is fluctuating, changing, variable, volatile. God's is stable, constant, unchanging. You've got to decide which truth you're going to hold to. Because one of them uh, can't really be truth at all. But if you hold to God's truth, I want to assure you that you're, you're on a solid foundation. You don't need to compromise. You don't be, you need to be intimidated by this, no matter what they find or what people say. Because if it were real, it wouldn't need to constantly evolve and shift just to accommodate every new identity. But knowing the truth and holding on to it uh, is not enough. I want you to stand with me, and I want you to just think about this as we close. This is, I went, I went over a little bit here. This is a tough, I just honestly finished hashing through this about a uh, half hour before I drove here so I didn't even know what it would take I just and, and and hopefully on this issue you understand this isn't something you can hop into or out of all the questions we've been dealing with up to now I've dealt with all those things I've written on I've done this I can deal with some of those in five to ten minutes I've written a lot of nutshell articles on those issues this is a different animal I could have taken any one of these identities, any one of those passages of scripture, any one of these things, and I could have preached uh, for a half hour, an hour on any one of those things and barely opened some of that up. This is a tough, tough issue. And even though we know where we stand and it seems simple, for people out there, the pat answers don't work. And we've got to understand what's going on. And we've got to open this conversation. So I hope this at least, even though it just skimmed the surface, maybe is opening some things we get to. But I want you to know this. Even though we might uh, say that I accept the truth, I can put all kinds of facts and arguments out there that may bolster your faith and convince you even more to hang on to it. But that's not going to do you or anybody else one bit of good if we don't approach God and them in the right attitude. And that's what I want to talk about next week. And this was some teaching, but next week I'm going to do a little more impassioned preaching. And, and I want you to be here for that because that's what we need to grasp hold of. And if you're here tonight just laying out all these facts and figures can, can maybe be a little bit imposing and, and maybe intimidating to you if you're struggling with this. I want you to come back next week because you're going to see the side I think God wants us to grasp a hold of this because in the days ahead, there's going to be people coming into this place struggling with these issues. And how are we going to respond? And how are we going to receive them? And I want you to be here next week to, to talk about that. I want you to invite somebody else to be here too because they need to hear uh, how it is that we need to respond in this culture if we're going to make any inroads at all with people who are struggling with issues or don't even know they're struggling with these issues.